Thanks everyone for joining us today as we talk about managing your business during a pandemic with a focus on talent, innovation, and client engagement. I'm excited to have a great panel today representing Africa, Europe, Asia, and North America. They provide a global perspective, which is really key because this has been a true global pandemic. This has obviously impacted you know, lives and businesses of everybody, all of us across the globe. So the panel today includes Sophie Rayberg, Managing Director of Professional Organizing Relocation in Germany and an esteemed member of the Euro Board, I might add. Renee mm -hmm. Stegman, Director of Relocation Africa based in South Africa. Rahman Narula, Managing Director of Formula Group in India. And I'm Rob Burns, CEO of IOR Global Services based in the U.S. Last year, when we were all putting our 2020 strategic plans together, I'm pretty sure nobody planned for a global pandemic. Uh, but we've all had to adapt and uh, adjust and manage our businesses during this period. Given the severity of the downturn and the impact on the relocation market, this has meant several things. You know, managing to survive and keep your business afloat by cutting costs, while at the same time trying to engage and motivate your talent working to innovate to meet you know, changing assigning needs, not only during this period, but for how things will look as we come out of this, and really trying to uh, add value and strengthen partnerships with our clients as assignment activities fallen off substantially. We'd love to have a really interactive session today, so please feel free to chat in any questions you have. We'll address those during the three focus areas rather than wait till the end. So during the talent innovation and client engagement uh, sections. Also feel free to uh, chat in any examples of what you guys have been doing to you know, manage your business during this period. Uh, and I'll relay some of that as well. And there's already been some really good chat and dialogue in the uh, WOVA app already. So excited to, uh, to see that. Uh, so let's get started with talent. With all the challenges and disruptions this year, managing the HR side of the business you know, has never been more challenging, frankly. So Renee, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you've led your team during this period? Sure, Rob, thanks so much. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing some of our ideas and things that we've managed to do during um, the last couple of months. Um, so sitting in Africa, we, one thing we're pretty used to is a pretty vol volatile in, environment. So we often refer to it as VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. We're used to it all. Um, so we realized quite early on that we really needed as leaders to get to grips with this and what it meant and how we needed to manage our team um, through this. Um, uh, nobody knew how long it's going to last, or we still don't know how long it's going to last and, and what the impact, the true impact of this will be. So we um, very quickly started engaging with um, like-minded owner-managed type businesses locally. We have a, gr a group called EO, which is the Entrepreneurs' Organization. Um, and then we also engaged quite heavily with um, other TIRA and EURA um, members around the world just to get a sense of how they were feeling, what they were doing in terms of their team. Um, and what we came out with was very much to try and give sort of the opposite of what VUCA was offering um, and to give our staff very, very much a feeling of comfort, comfort and certainty, which let me tell you has been so challenging with um, in South Africa, our um, the equivalent of furlough has been a very unnavigable, um, strange place with not, no guarantee in terms of budgeting to make sure our staff were receiving the income they certainly deserved um, during this tough time. So um, we have um, managed a couple of strategies um, and the one was um, to remain very um, open in terms of our communication strategy, uh, structure as well as over communicate. So, um, we really did engage with them as a team right from the beginning to walk them through the sort of processes, the research we were doing to try and understand how this was best placed to be able to manage them and ourselves and our business through the pandemic. 
Um, our business's um, sort of byline is um, to embrace the unknown. And one of the team talks came um, back saying, you know, it's actually quite interesting how we constantly tell our sort of st our clients to embrace the unknown of Africa as they relocate here. And now suddenly we were using it on ourselves to embrace this unknown. Um, and so by that we decided we wanted to do the opposite of keeping our people in the dark and really just sharing and over communicating um, with all our stakeholders. So we cover the continent of Africa. And so our other stakeholders are obviously our, our head office staff as well as um, our consultants across um, the continent. Um, so we also kept them regularly updated and started engaging with them on a regular basis. Um, and then obviously our clients and partners. Um, and also through this process, we, we became rather vulnerable as leaders and not in a weak way, but rather in um, a way to show that, you know, we weren't saying we know the answers, we have the answers during this process and that we really needed our team support to guide us through this time and um, help us make those very tough decisions. Yeah. Um, part of this was also about, I guess, you know, embracing the unknown, we don't know what the future holds and the reality of a pandemic like this is job loss um, or sort of uncertain times for, for, for the skills that we have. So we encouraged our people to um, uplift themselves um, for multiple purposes. Um, one purpose obviously just being uh, relevant once we come out the other side of this pandemic. Um, the other one was that should they need to go to the job market, they would be relevant themselves to be able to offer those skill sets to other industries that aren't as maybe impacted as ours. So those were some of the things we focused on. Um, we are currently focusing on a um, work from home, work from office um, strategy. And um, there's been lots of conversation, as you said, on the WOVA app about this. And I know it will vary from country to country, um, industry to industry. Um, but we are quite excited about um, working on this project with our team to see, see if we can uncover a strategy that will work for the business going forward and trying to balance quite carefully what we believe is wellness and productivity at the same time. So those are some of our strategies that we've um, um, embarked on. And as I say, some of them are still very much in the making. Great, thanks Renee. And I know as we kind of met as a panel, all of us talked about the open communication and the over communication uh, with remote, with everybody working with remote, uh, as well as just all the, you know, uncertainty during this time. Also really like the concept uh, you had of making the employees part of the solution, which I think is really key. Uh, Roman, let me shift over to you. Uh, could you talk about how you've kept your team, you know, engaged and motivated during these last several months? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I just, as you correctly said, uh, you know, nobody heard of COVID uh, before the coronavirus. And I guess uh, when it hit us, it hit us uh, pretty hard. Uh, you know, um, actually, I'll be honest, uh, the, the first month when we had a lockdown, which is end of March, uh, I think the whole of April, we were literally just treating it as a vacation. We were all in a slumber. We were all at home, uh, enjoying being at home and so on and so forth. And with, with, a, with the thought that this would, uh, change. I mean, this will not last for another, you know, for maybe another month or so, and things will be fine by May, you know, and by the time April ended and May began, uh, I guess it, it kind of dawned on us and like it dawned on a lot of people across the world that this ain't going nowhere, my friend. Uh, wake up. This is going, this is <laughs> for a long time. Um, and I guess we really got out of the slumber. Uh, we realized that we need to start connecting with the team who were, who were also in the same space, uh, you know, uh, reconnected our teams, uh, Got them on calls, set up a pattern to, uh, to, 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 to start talking in on calls, start talking about what's, you know, what's happening uh, you know, uh, with them, what's happening in their personal lives and so on. So, so I guess the first thing we did was to set up a pattern of communication where we restarted our regular communication with our teams. One, I guess the second most important thing, which also I guess which, which, which dawned on each one of us was that, hey, our budgets are, have gone for a six. You know, the, it's, it's, not, it's not the same what we did. The last month is not going to happen for the next few months. And uh, so I guess uh, having some candid uh, conversation with the team, uh, they also realize that, yes, you know, things are changing. Your, you know, cash inflows, outflows are not the same as 
they used to be, so we have to balance them out, uh, take necessary steps which would affect them too, uh, and, uh, and, and, and kind of make very so that was very important, I guess. Uh, I guess what information to the news, we realized that uh, there's so much happening. Uh, we, we also realized that we need to, uh, you know, we need to get going. We need to start doing something else, so, you know, and, and, add, and add value. Uh, so I guess uh, post the calls, we also started, uh, you know, looking at stuff and started giving projects to our team members, like simple things like upgrading our process manuals. Uh, what we what we had was suddenly obsolete. I had had big blaring gaps because the new uh, with COVID, the new words like virtual tours, uh, virtual this, virtual that, uh, you know, suddenly kicked in, and we realized that we need to have a process for that. So we so so you know putting into place uh, new uh, giving responsibility uh, to people to start upgrading process manuals to see how things could be done better or differently. Now uh, bringing into account the fact that there is something called COVID that it's not necessarily the signing will come and shake hands with you. You will have to do a namaste, for example, or you will have to spend more time on a phone call, uh, understand the needs of the uh, signing much better so that you uh, just don't uh, spend that much time on the field with them uh, to help them finalize a place or, or have a virtual uh, tour as like what everybody's uh, doing right now. So so I guess, uh, I guess we engage people by giving them uh, projects to uh, to upgrade manuals, uh, we had we, we also had a, a emails exchange, and we had talked some new ideas, and, and we, we we pushed and motivated our teams to come back with what other new ideas they would have. And I guess you know I think it worked very well. So there was also a a, a plus side to to this, where we actually got a lot of brilliant ideas from people, and we actually made and and we actually made them the project owners of those ideas. So we're actually currently working on some project ideas which will help us create new revenue models or revenue streams, maybe for 2021, 2022, you never know. Uh, so that was that was, that was was brilliant, I think that was a good side uh, of the communication we had. Uh, I guess at the same time, we also realized that the skill sets uh, our teams had uh, in terms of dealing with people, you know, the, the, the level of anxiety of every person, including the consultant or including the signee was, was definitely much, was, would be much different. Uh, we actually engage a psychologist to help upgrade the, the skill sets of our consultants with the vision that, you know, our consultants will no longer be consultants. They will soon be coaches. They will move from being consultants to be coaches uh, so that they can, uh, by, by upgrading their skill sets and how to manage a client expectation better, how to uh, understand the client much better, how to read the mind of the clients much better, and how to manage their own minds much better. Uh, and, we, and we still have calls going on uh, between our psychologists and our teams on a regular basis, uh, which, is a, which has been a very interesting project because it's not just talking to the psychologists about upgrading their skills, but it also has been a way of them downloading uh, what, they, what they feel. And it's, it's, and it's also a way for us to understand that how uh, connect our team while they're working from home, which is an alien environment for them, for most of us actually. Uh, of course, now a lot of us have got used to it. Many of us love it. Uh, and so on. So I guess the uh, I think it's been it's been a very interesting uh, last few months. Uh, you know, talking to the teams, connecting with them, giving them new projects. Twenty five of our team members did the new uh, the MIM certificates uh, certification, which is uh, that time. And we never expect them to have twenty five of our team members getting those certificates. Uh, you know, it 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 was uh, it's uh, these are tough times. But I guess there is always a flip side to, uh, to everything or to every coin. There are two sides. So I guess it's how uh, how one kind of engages your, engages their teams, how one uh, uses the uses time to add value and to create new skills, new products, new services. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's exactly what we did, and it's uh, and it's still going on. And I think it's not getting over yet. So we have to be on top of uh, our game. That's 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 what I feel right now. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Ramon. You mentioned um, you know, employees coming up with new ideas, and I think that's a really interesting point as well as a segue to, uh, to innovation because you know, obviously with uh, capital expenditures being uh, pulled back a little bit given business conditions, I think our, we've all really relied on new ideas and innovation to be driven you know, by our employees. So I'm gonna go back to, um, uh, to Renee. Uh, we'd love to hear you know, what what are some of the um, enhancements that you've made to 
uh, to the assignee experience and some things that you've done to uh, innovate during this period. Thanks, Rob. Um, so right in the beginning, we pulled it as a team together and we brainstormed a couple of ideas. And one of the things we decided was we wanted to make an impact on um, the actual client cost rather than just innovate for the sake of innovating. So we wanted to make sure we were relevant. So we wanted to really look at some of the costs and I know some of listening today probably heard my story before, but I studied um, the costs and um, hurdles on expats on the continent of Africa. And specifically the big costs that always come up are, you know, household goods, accommodation, salary. So those are the big costs. And that's really where our clients need to save their money. So we brainstormed a couple of ideas. And one of the ones that made sense for us because we were unsure um, that people would travel or feel confident to travel straight away. And we felt businesses would need those, um, those skills in Africa. And so we um, looked at considering how we could bring an orientation tour to a person's home in their home country um, and to review what that host country would look like um, and hopefully make a decision on their assignment um, coming to that location. So we are um, hoping to launch our first uh, city, which is Cape Town, um, in the next month or so. And the idea for this virtual tour, um, it's actually a virtual orientation tour. Um, is to make sure that the client has a good overview as if they were physically present, but give them a feeling of the city. So our, um, and another big thing in terms of this decision of trying to reduce costs for clients is obviously our strategy was automate anything that's a repetitive task and obviously find efficiencies in processes which could save time for the client. And our other objective, which is um, part of the SDGs, which is the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030, was to obviously reduce um, the impact on the environment, um, et cetera. So we came up with this idea of um, the virtual orientation tour, and we've used um, a couple of um, technologies. Um, so one is um, giving them a 3D look around Cape Town, our city, um, through a 3D tour, which will include both a video tour of the city as well as the, a Google Earth um, a tour. Um, and then what we've done is um, actually provided a, a large amount of content um, through various mediums like interviews on different schooling systems. So for example, international schools, um, special needs schools, um, government schools, private schools. So they would have a good sense of what the education system like, was like in that country. And then we took it further to the housing um, and area overview, which would give them then a good idea of each of the different areas and each of the types and costs of houses. Um, and we go into a lot more detail as well. And this is an integrated um, service delivery, which would also come with um, some sort of telephone calls with consultants or specialists in that area, as well as um, a login to a portal with additional information to support um, the likes of a virtual orientation tour. So we haven't launched it yet, but um, we're hoping for some good feedback. And it was quite interesting in the development of this is um, how many moving parts there are in terms of an orientation and trying to put it together into a consolidated view of one city and we cover many African cities um, has been a very big project, but we do believe that this can certainly both save a client the flight costs, visa costs, accommodation costs, as well as time in terms of an, a potential assignee moving to a new location, making a decision on um, whether they will accept that assignment based on the city um, tour. We've done a lot of other um, development during this time. Um, we spoke to a lot of our direct clients and some of the um, services in Africa that um, they felt were missing. Um, in Africa, a lot of the bigger businesses don't have what they call a global mobility lead. So they have an HR manager, for example, or a, re a remuneration and benefits manager, but they don't have what they call a global mobility lead. Um, although a lot of them fulfill the glo global mobility roles, they're not specialists in those areas. 
So we've actually launched an advisory section which specifically targets companies who don't have global mobility um, strategic input um, that service um, to their businesses for um, just helping them set up um, in terms of what their global mobility strategy would be on the continent of Africa. We also spoke earlier about how we wanted to, with our stakeholders to really have a visual view of what's going on. Africa being a large continent and obviously with all the different borders opening up um, or closing down due to um, COVID and restrictions, um, we developed something called um, the Africa heat map, which gives everyone an indication of which countries are opening and those that aren't open for business. Um, we and that we found our clients we got a lot of feedback um, how wonderful that has been for them to be making decisions there are complexities going down the road so South Africa today is um, open for business but um, the list um, of restricted com uh, countries is longer than my arm um, so there's going to come other complications around notifying clients on which countries are um, accepted in terms of doing business um, in all of our locations so those have been some of the developments. We are doing a lot more video um, videos, so on all of our social media, as well as even through our portal, giving clients more information by video as opposed to lengthy, long documents. Um, so we've been, you know, developing a lot of that, um, just really enhancing the client, ex the the signee and client experience, to make you know some of those services a lot more easily accessible. And then like I think I've heard a lot of my other counterparts doing all over the world is a no fat, no fat, no fun service, which is very much around the virtual service offering. So very much um, remote delivery, um, and what we call is DIY sort of do it yourself type programs. Um, and one of the concerns that came up from someone I was chatting to was, um, it, you know, that this potentially is taking away from our clientele who wants you know, um, a, a sort of high touch, high service. And I think that from our perspective in Africa, we don't receive high volumes, never have. And so if we're not diversifying and not broadening what we have to offer, we will probably lose it to a new market, market entry, entrant into our market who then offers sort of a low touch service. Um, so those, that's part of what we've done over this um, six month period. Oh, that's great. I think the no fuss, no fun service might need a little marketing help, but uh, you know, otherwise, <laughs> some, some great, uh, some great things. And it really is interesting how many opportunities come out of you know, this type period where we have to be creative and and adapt and really adjust our uh, our services. So, Sophie, I haven't forgotten about you. I uh, see you there in your uh, your gorgeous red jacket. Um, so I wanted to ask. Uh, you, how have you either adapted your services or, you know, have you created, have you also created new services during this period? We have, and I'd like to start off, if I can, by just asking Renee a question on what she just said. Um, do you have sort of a, a timeline set for yourself in which you're going to test this online uh, orientation tour? Like, have you said, okay, we're going to test it on X amount of clients or X amount of time before we establish whether we think it's going to work or not? So uh, um, we're hoping that we're going to launch um, literally imminent by the end of October. Um, and our idea is to then test it uh, locally with um, sort of graduate type programs um, with some of our direct clients. Um, we will roll it out um, for Cape Town. So it obviously is very Cape Town focused, this first one. And there's not, you know, the mass of our clients are Joburg, Kenya, Nigeria, other locations. So. We do need to test it first. Um, so we're hoping by beginning of January to uh, at least have Johannesburg up and going as well. So there is a rollout test phase and then um, Johannesburg is next in line. Okay. And what made you start off with Cape Town? Uh, I live here. <laughs> okay. Um, but so it was just beautiful. the fact that you're local, it was, I mean, because it could, you could have also gone somewhere where there's highest volume or where it's, there's just, I don't know, there's a whole yeah. lot of decision factors that could have... Yeah, so it was going to be Johannesburg, Cape Town and Durban all at once, okay. but we've decided to do Cape Town rollout first and then Johannesburg and Durban next, um, and then go into the African countries. Johannesburg and Cape Town are our biggest volume areas. Okay. Cool. Okay, sorry, Rob, I just wanted to 
put in a question. No, no, no. Um, I should have probably put it in through the app, but hey. Um, so yeah, we did uh, quite a lot as well. Um, however, we sort of, um, I think we, we originally were a little bit gutted, I'll be free to say, that we are not able to invest or that we won't invest into, for example, the big IT project that we had planned for this year, simply because we all need to just see where this road is going to take us. Um, what we did do, and we sort of, we were thinking about it when, when the lockdown initiated, and then of course borders closed, and once um, borders closed, it became apparent that for specific types of employees, we could still get them into the country and we could, under specific circumstances, still get them visas for whatever country they were coming from through the German um, consulates and missions all over the world. And so we, uh, we thought about, okay, how can we, um, what, what clients do we have that would potentially be able to get their employees into the country and what would we need to do to make that happen. And so we, um, we sort of created and I'll call it an entry package um, where we said, okay, you know, you have um, employee X and based on education and the employment he's taking up in Germany, he or she's taking up in Germany and the employer that they're going to, uh, we believe that we have a case of, of getting entry for them and preparing documents for, um, for whatever authorities uh, needed to be involved in the process. So for example, a lot of German consulates and requesting appointments and um, providing them with what they needed along with, okay, now this, this employee has um, a visa or a work permit, what's needed and how can we actually get them across borders? So um, that meant involving German border police, uh, putting in requests and saying, okay, employee here is arriving and um, this is the documentation. Will you please give an they call it an okay to board to the specific um, country of origin. And then also, of course, what could we do in, in getting uh, the families in? Could we get them in at the same time? Could we not? If we couldn't, when could we get them in? What would we need? Um, so there was a lot of sort of uh, liaison going with, uh, with the specifics um, and, and we were able to sell that uh, very well because uh, you know a number of companies were just very keen on getting people in and um, and it worked a lot better than we initially thought it would work. We got, we, we're still getting um, a much higher number of clients into the country uh, than we initially in, expected, which of course is great because once they're here, we can also, um, you know, can continue with the rollout of, of all of the other authorized services that we're then managed or then contracted to, um, to assist with. And also what came along with that and that sort of complemented our entry package is that we um, we sold a quarantine package and we said, okay, if you're coming from one of the areas that Germany considers high risk, what do we need to do? Um, sadly, it's not as easy as only saying, okay, you're from high risk country A and you're coming into Germany. But of course, every little German state has its own rules and they're not only the state, but also um, the local authorities. And so then it meant getting tested, um, getting clients tested, making sure that, you know, we knew in whatever country they were coming from, where they needed to go to get tested, how long the results would take, how they would make payment. Um, and then once they were here, get them tested again, possibly or not, or only get them tested here, um, getting them doctor's notes, making sure that they always, uh, you know, were in quarantine and also making sure that the authorities were notified and avoiding fines for our corporate clients. And so that's um, been really busy and it's not it's probably not the most motivating amount of work my team will tell you, simply because it's, it involves a very, very high number of different authorities that are some more and some less eager to help you out with what you need to get done. But it's been, um, it's been really, really good in the way that it's allowed us to get a significantly higher number of clients into the country than we, when the lockdown started and when borders closed than we thought that we were going to get in. And of course, every border that opens and reopens is, is a good one. Um, although at the moment, uh, Germany is very welcoming to people from Papua New Guinea and sadly they're not my biggest group of clients. So we might just need to start recruiting some clients in Papua New Guinea. Um, so that's next on the list. And um, we then of course also, if we had people that needed to be in quarantine for longer periods of time because um, different reasons they couldn't get tested or the testing was delayed, um, 
we implemented quarantine packages and were able to ensure that they had sufficient foodstuffs and water and everything available that they needed. And we were able to, um, you know, we tried to stay away from, I'm, uh, I'd like this in this specific type of salami, but of course we gave people the chance to say, okay, I'm allergic to A or I'm vegetarian or vegan or lactose intolerant or whatever any other technology on the planet people have and put together packages for them that would always go for 48 to 36 hours and that would just ensure that we could keep them happy until they were able to be released from quarantine. And of course, that's also something that's worked quite well. Germany is a country where online delivery exists, but it's not as accessible if you don't really know what you're doing. So it's very difficult for somebody to arrive uh, and not speak German and figure out within a couple of hours where to order food. So that's, um, yeah, it's been really, really good. And it's also allowed us to, to invest in, in even deeper partnerships with our clients in regards to consultancy. And then we've also had, and this is quite interesting to hear if, if other companies have experienced the same, we had quite a high number of clients that were here and fled to their home countries uh, once the pandemic really hit. And um, so we also ended up completely packing households, like literally people packed a suitcase and flew off to where they wanted to be. And um, we were um, supervising, supervising packers, we were organizing moves more than we normally would. Um, we were shipping pets, or, well, through pet shipping companies, of course, but we were, um, we were organizing basically the whole disassemble of, of, of a life in Germany, which is much more than, of course, a normal departure would, um, would entail. And that's actually been really, really exciting. It's also fairly labor intensive work, all of this, but um, I think in the current times, it's better to be at work than not, whatever that may be. Definitely. No, we've seen a big, big uptick in departure services, mm. leave extensions, uh, and the like, which uh, normally are, you know, one to a one and a half day service. Seems like a lot of these are taking just three, four, five days to, uh, uh, to do now with all the, uh, all the complexities. Yeah. Um, so a couple notes before we pivot to, um, uh, to client engagement. Uh, first, don't forget to chat in any questions or comments you have. We've gotten some nice comments like hello from Stockholm and uh, Madrid, so appreciate that. Um, and secondly, anyone listening from Papua New Guinea, please uh, contact <laughs> me directly. Uh, Yay! Contact information is on the, on the WOVA app. Okay, Ramon, um, as we uh, move towards client engagement, um, could you talk about how you've approached you know, client communication and you know, what types of insights uh, you've been sharing during this time? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, uh, I'll go back to the slumber we all went into. So I think once we got out of that slumber, we realized, uh, you know, we, we don't uh, only have to connect with our, uh, our teams, but uh, we have to reconnect with our clients too, uh, because we, hey, we were all thinking that they would be you know, out back in office in May, uh, and, and that didn't happen and that, that still not happened really. Uh, so I guess, uh, I guess we, the first thing we did was to actually start uh, telling our teams to start connecting uh, with our clients. And this meant not sending them just emails and, and, and uh, you know, uh, or electronic communication. Uh, we, uh, we were pushing, uh, including myself, I mean, uh, in our business, we, we not only work with our MCs, but we also have a huge amount of direct clients. Uh, so, so I guess we, 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 we initiated and we pushed our teams to get in touch with clients, pick up the phone and call them and check how they are, what they're doing. Uh, and I think that went very well. Uh, a lot of clients uh, responded. We realized that many were in town, many had left on, 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 uh, on flights, which were, uh, you know, just before the lockdown happened. Uh, so that was important. Uh, also, I, I noticed that, uh, you know, uh, when we started connecting with clients, uh, which was very important. And uh, uh, that, that things were changing and, and a lot of clients who were not very open to picking up phone calls and were happy getting it or were more in a habit of getting emails, uh, became more and more, uh, you know, have, op have opened up more and more to taking phone calls. And, and uh, I think that this is, a, this is a brilliant time because, uh, you know, I'm talking more to a lot of companies. I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, MDs or senior uh, executives of, of big companies are now, um, uh, you know, uh, accessible on phone. I can pick up the phone and talk to them. They pick up my call or they pick up our team's call. 
that you know that was that was very good. Uh, I'm sure you know uh, this would be similar in other countries too. Uh, I think communicating communicating with clients there was another agenda. The agenda was really I'm just going through what is it that they needed during this time to fulfill. And I think that uh, that was very important and 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 uh, that helped us understand. And uh, innovate, and I'll connect that to innovation uh, services, which we realized was the need of the moment. Uh, you know, simple thing. We we had a client who reached out to us and said that I need all my lease rentals renegotiated. I need my security deposits to be reduced. And we actually created a scope of work and a pricing, and we gave it to them. Uh, they approved, and we actually uh, had business, and we were uh, you know, and which was you know, while we were uh, earlier, we were putting apartments on rent and 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 taking lease and uh, brokerages or service fees or whatever. And right now we. Were, but actually charging a service fee for reducing those lease rentals or terminating leases and, and, and helping with departure services and so on. Um, there were all kinds of needs. I mean, we have, we, you know, when we connected with the client, there were clients who were leaving and we wanted to sell their cars and we came up with a model where we would help them sell their vehicles and so on, or their furniture, uh, so on. Uh, a lot of people, as, uh, as Sophie said, just, and they packed this, gone homes or land, uh, Came out, uh, you know, home sanitization service. Some of the clients, uh, mm. and so on. Supervision service, actually, uh, where we would send somebody. Uh, somebody would go there twice a month and check uh, the, uh, you know, uh, no utility bills uh, lying anywhere, or uh, no damage done. No, no. That was a lot appreciated by clients when we spoke to them, uh, and they they want to reply this. Uh, yeah, Rahman, I'm, I'm sorry to, uh, to uh, Rahman. Um, during these times, so we actually have a sanitation. Uh, I think Rahman's uh, bandwidth is uh, is coming out a little bit, um, but uh, you know, I I really totally agree with the point <clears throat> that Rahman. Uh, had made about um, about picking up the phone, <clears throat> or you know, during this time a video call. You know, we've found also that clients have been much more willing to. Uh, I think with everybody being remote and kind of missing some of the interaction, much more willing to you know get on the phone, get on a video call. Uh, in that there's really a good two way street of information and a lot that we can learn uh, from them as well. So Sophie, let me let me go back to you. You're know, talking about kind of the two-way communication with, um, you know, with our clients. Um, can you talk a little bit about the dialogue that you've been having with clients and maybe how that's, you know, helped your partnerships? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I just think, by the way, I just think that we've lost Roman. Um, yeah. Can you bring him? Somebody bring him back. Um, I think that it's been of value for us that we have. Um, a very high percentage of direct clients um, because they've probably more than in a non-pandemic situation needed us to um, assist them in, in, in clearing up uh, after employees that have left or in, in um, resolving immigration issues or assisting with immigration issues rather and um, helping with, um, you know, basic consultancy um, in regards to, okay, we assume maybe this, or we assume maybe that, or what can we do? Um, or, you know, just, just being a, a partner more than a supplier in many ways. Um, we've shared a lot of best practices and we've helped uh, establish best practices in, in, um, for our corporate clients and with them. We've also sort of tried and made a, um, create a little bit of a network between different direct clients um, and sort of encourage them to, to speak to each other about experiences that they were having from a mobility perspective, which has been, um, yeah, which has been really great. Um, and also just allowing for us to sort of be, be a part of, of, of their thinking process, which, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'd lean to say that we are quite a lot anyway, but it's very different in, in the times of a pandemic where, um, where there's just so much change in such a short amount of time and, um, you know, the agile workforce all of a sudden based on, on issues everywhere over the world isn't as agile anymore. Um, and um, so, yeah, everybody's working from home, but how, 
um, how does that actually work and does it work and when do we bring people back and do you bring people back that really want to work from home in, in their home country and so it's just it's been quite a lot more of a partnership and working together than a client supplier um, relationship and we feel that that's um, that's also been very motivating for us as a company um, simply because the the appreciation that sort of um, trickled back to us not only from from our corporate clients but also from the clients has been um, yeah has been really good and we're really grateful okay great uh, thanks so much Sophie um, you know, one of the questions that came in that I thought was was interesting was um, you know allowing employees to work from home has been you know essential during this pandemic as we all know um, do you think this will remain with us or do you see employees wanting to return to the office environment to capture the you know, the benefits of, of personal interaction? Um, I'm going to make a comment then would love for, you know, Ramon, uh, Renee, Sophie to jump in as well. I know one of the things that's really important for, you know, for our business is our, is our company culture. And we've always felt that a really big part of that is the office culture. And obviously, you know, these last six months, we've been virtual. We have the office open, but very much on a uh, low volume and um, voluntary um, basis. So, you know, doing a lot of things, you know, we talked about communication earlier, you know, over communication, you know, Zoom happy hours, things like that, um, to really try to keep the, um, the culture and the camaraderie and the collaboration going. And you know, we found that that's worked really well. Um, particularly, Ramon mentioned different projects for the employees. Um, we've done the same thing. As volumes have decreased, we have been able to uh, put employees onto um, you know projects that were really important and strategic to us, but that you know, frankly, we just didn't have time to get to when when things were busier. Uh, so that's been a great way for people to work mm. um, across teams and kind of get out of the silos that they might be in. Uh, ordinarily. Uh, the other thing that we've done that's been kind of fun is we've hosted some outside uh, events for our team. Uh, in fact, last night we had a retirement party for um, uh, one of our colleagues and, you know, hosted that in the kind of um, courtyard between our uh, buildings. So we've had a few events there. We've even had a tailgate, which may be a U.S. thing, but a tailgate in our, uh, in our parking lot uh, here. So we have done some things to kind of try to responsibly, you know, get together and, uh, and collaborate. Um, I'll open it up to you guys. Any, any thoughts from uh, the panel on this? Yeah, so I, um, I think it's quite an interesting one. Um, I saw the discussion on the app and I'm, um, I think it will depend or it will be quite a hybrid situation with working at home and coming to the office. I think that in, in our experience, at least, everybody, all of my employees that were really keen to work from home called me a week into it and said, okay, can I please come back to the office? And employees where you thought, okay, they're just really not the work at home type of people. They're quite happy. Um, and I think that in the end that it'll, it, it will teach us. I mean, at least it taught us. We're a very, in many ways, a fairly traditional company and um, working from home was not an issue before the pandemic. So all of a sudden in you know, a matter of days you have outsourced or outlined mm -hmm. the whole company into home office. Um, and it's worked a lot better than I ever thought it would, not only from a technological side, but also from managing it and keeping everybody together and, um, you know, motivating them to speak with each other and have little, you know, maybe not meet the whole team, but have little team meetings to ensure that they saw each other and that they could keep the knowledge exchange going. Um, but I think that eventually we will probably end up in a situation where, um, it'll be quite flexible and where there will be a lot less, especially in Germany, you know, where, where people like to know where everybody is all the time. Um, it'll be a lot easier and it'll be like, okay, fine. I'm going to be in the office on Monday and Tuesday and I'm just not going to be in the office the next three days. And as long as everybody knows I'm doing what I need to do, that's fine. And then that's actually quite a, um, I think in many ways that that could potentially be quite liberating for a lot of us. Mm. Yeah, I can come in. I so we, we did India, this project. Uh, let me add. Okay. Sorry, Renee, you want to go? Renee, why not? Sure. Uh, why not you Sure. Um, so just from our um, work from home, work from office um, project that we've done for the last month, um, part of 
you know, giving it over to the um, employees to try and develop and come up with these ideas, a lot of what they've had to do is, um, you know, sort of um, troubleshoot. So for example, little things like what happens if, a, you know, there's no one in the office one day, who's going to answer the front door or um, someone's going to pick up a passport or drop off a passport um, or someone, you know, phones in and, you know, there's one person in the office that day, how do, how do those calls get redirected? So they've worked on this project for the last month and come up with some creative solutions to, you know, get over some of those hurdles. Um, because they're trying very hard to um, have a flexible approach of a work from home, work from office situation. So very much a hybrid approach. And they've even discussed like advantages and disadvantages in terms of, for example, working from home, you know, can get quite lonely. But, you know, if you've got a hybrid approach, you could balance that out. Some people are more productive at home. Some people are more productive at the office. Um, so they really are looking at how these can suit them. Obviously, you know, as discussed on the app, there's some industries which, you know, for example, pure immigration, you could easily work from home almost all the time. Mm -hmm. um, from a DSP perspective, and a lot of the stuff we do from a bigger team perspective and across um, the continent, you know, we do already work mostly virtually with our teams all over Africa, but there's a lot of collaboration that happens. And like I say to my team, you know, I'm running the ship and, you know, I want to be able to lead a ship, not blindly. So we've got to make sure that when we um, driving these work from home, work from um, office solutions, that we make sure that the output is very clear to the person who's driving the ship because they can't be trying to understand what everyone's doing while trying to generate income for the business and drive a business forward. So it's been a very interesting month. Um, and, you know, we still kind of haven't got to a very defined policy. And as Sophie, you said, I think it's going to be sort of an evolution of something rather than, you know, tomorrow morning we can all go, you know, on this flexible approach. I think it is. And one of the questions that came up, which um, I think will become more of more relevant as we go is the occupational health and safety um, mm -hmm. considerations. And also, you know, let's face it, in the office, we have lovely chairs and desks and, you know, all ergonomical. At home, you know, people are sitting on couches, you know, bar counters at their kitchen, you know, how healthy is that? And those types of questions I think will come as we develop these, you know, flexible solutions. My attitude is maybe different to others, but I think we need to consider it and be sort of open-minded. Um, I don't think there's though a one size fits all is my view on it. And it's gonna be really interesting, Renee, because for example, um, it's, it's also very dependent on, I think, in which countries has which rules in regards to working from home and what's your responsibility as an employer if you have somebody, if you allow people to work from home, what setup do you need to give them? Do you need to, you know, Give them a give them some kind of a tunnel or a, or a cloud or whatever to work with and then they can all plug in their own equipment or do you actually need to put together a complete workstation for somebody and then does that include a chair and um how expensive is that supposed to be and can you deduct it from taxes yes or no and do you have as a as a company um the financial resources to do that on one go immediately for everybody depending of course on the size of your team or do you then make make decisions on okay I'm going to do you guys first and you guys not and what sort of that's it's going to be it's actually not a very it, it's it's quite a complex conversation to have within a team I think mm -hmm. very much yeah. so um yeah yeah um I'm going to show my age by saying hot off the presses here uh but there is one uh, final question that's uh, come in why don't we take one more and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up uh, and it's a good one uh, do you foresee as a result of COVID-19 a complete shift or a reboot in the way global, global mobility businesses operate uh, in 2021 onwards? Anyone want to? I can try. Look, um, you know, I think it would be naive of us to think that there's, oh, Roman. Yeah, I, I, I can try too. Oh, sorry, Greg. Uh, go ahead, Rahman. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I think 2021 is going to be uh, a totally different year. In a country like India, I must, I can admit that, uh, you know, uh, getting ready and going to office was, was really the thing. 
uh, at least uh, from the environment we were working in. And I know that a lot of our team members uh, are itching to come back to office and get ready and, and go. And I think they, they miss that. Uh, but uh, I guess COVID has taught us a lot. I think I, I, I could never believe that uh, we could actually do and uh, what we're doing and deliver services by working from home. And, and for me, too, too, that was, uh, but I mean, that, that's very minimal. But uh, I think the learning from COVID is that you could actually, uh, I mean, next year would definitely be a hybrid model. Uh, we could actually run an operation with, with a hybrid model where you could have people working from home and delivering services. Uh, from a commercial angle, I think uh, I see that, you know, you could run an even more profitable business uh, because your overheads would be lower because you would not need uh, uh, a, a much uh, a larger office space as we used to have uh, in, the, in the past. We could do with smaller infrastructure, with a lesser infrastructure. Uh, of course, ensuring that people sitting at home have uh, you know, the right infrastructure to be able to deliver services um, and, and so on. Uh, so I guess uh, the, the running a business, a mobility business, or, uh, you know, with operations and, and services and client interactions um, would be a very interesting, would be a hybrid model in 2021. Where uh, where you could actually have uh, you know you could actually be doing the same thing uh, at a lower cost and at a higher profit actually uh, so that's my take that it could be actually a more profitable venture for a lot of us uh, where we used to spend a lot more money on uh, creating infrastructure for our offices and people to come and work uh, out of. Rani, do you? Yeah, I'm just if I could, yeah. Rob, I'll just try and try and. Um, and ask a question and I'll be short because I'm really interested to just hear what Renee thinks about the question. Um, I 100% think that this will change our industry. Um, I think that, um, you know, it, when borders closed, uh, at least, you know, when, when Europe closed its borders, um, I think we all expected them to reopen fairly quickly and then they didn't and then they did, but only partially. And now all of a sudden we're seeing that it's not only a pandemic game, but it's also a little bit, it's not a little bit, it's also quite political. So now we're seeing that, you know, countries are basing opening borders on reciprocation of that. Um, so how fast will that happen? How do the, does the pandemic develop? Um, if we get a, sh if we get a shot against the vaccination, what will happen? How, what percentage of people are actually comfortable getting a vaccine that has, arguably had less less trial phase than than other vaccines um, and also what will happen with travel I mean it, I think that it's very very likely to to assume that travel in 2021 will be nowhere what it was until March 2020 um, business travel will be a lot less a lot of um, you know a lot of clients that a lot of us may have serviced uh, for business travel or for short-term assignments may not come anymore, but there may be other kinds of assignments that then take place. So I think that it's definitely going to be a year, 2021, in which we will need to spend a lot of time on reflecting what value our businesses, each and every one of us, add to our clients and how we diversify and innovate and ensure that we remain interesting to where we need to be and to have our goals set straight and to ensure that we're doing what we do to the highest possible quality level. And I also think that working together, all of us as not only as Yura, but it doesn't matter if you're, you know, Yura or Tira or whatever other, other um, corporation you belong to, but to us as an industry to, to know our worth. Mm, certainly. That's great, um, yeah. Uh, Renee, why don't we wrap up with you about two minutes, if that's okay. Okay, sure. Um, so I, I just think about it, you know, how we have all struggled um, to sort of get out and go to a restaurant, you know. Um, I think, you know, practically speaking, we're going to have to try and do the opposite of VUCA. So give everyone confidence and a level of comfort in terms of moving to a new location. So kind of a sort of oversupply of information, I guess, would be, I think, fairly important. And I'll just give you another example is that if someone was saying, listen, you can go on assignment to X, let's not name any countries, X or Y country, and one you know has got really good medical facilities, really good information about how to manage the situation during the pandemic, you know, even while the virus is going around, or 
just giving that client that level of comfort when they relocate, I think is going to be very important going forward. Um, but I do think people are going to be more skeptical about, you know, grabbing, you know, their family and moving country. Um, I think volumes will change. And I think the length of assignment, um, and certainly in Africa, we've, we've seen a lot more um, shift to shorter term contracts. Um, and so, you know, I think as Sophie says, you know, the, the, um, continuation of our industry certainly is going to continue, but it is a, with a changed face with, you know, adapted services and service models. And we need to remain relevant, diversified in order to try and continue matching those needs of the client. Um, immigration as well. I mean, just think of the nomads who, you know, can work in Barbados, I believe, you know, or any of these other sort of nomadic locations, um, you know, it's going to make visa and immigration um, countries more competitive with each mm -hmm. other. And so that could either open up or close down certain countries like the US has closed down um, that opportunity, but it'll open up other locations who are think differently about um, talent. So it's going to be interesting times um, that I have no doubt. Great. <clears throat> well, Renee, Sophie, Roman, uh, thanks so much. Wanted to thank everyone who attended and uh, also for all the comments and, uh, and questions that came in. Uh, really appreciate that. So hope you all have a great rest of the morning, afternoon, uh, and evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob.